first episode of binary jazz a new podcast that is the most amazing podcast you've ever heard i am yep. not binary gary that would be my co-host here uh he is binary gary on the internets he is gary not on the internets um and in most other circumstances and i met him uh at a former agency that we both worked at that shall not be named. Um, and the most memorable thing about him was how annoying he was. Um, and that's why we decided to make this podcast. <laughs> that's like the most accurate introduction I've ever had. <laughs> I might use that on my next um, like tech conference. Uh, I think you should. Throw notes. Yeah. I, I definitely think you should. So um, my co-host is Jazz Sequence, Chris off the internet. Um, Chris is a musician, a developer. A vegan, um, the guy I annoyed with a million questions in my first dev job. Um, I'm curious though, why wouldn't we name that agency? I don't know. I just think it makes okay. it more mysterious. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I like the folks there. They're good folks. Yes. Um, and I, uh, I'm at a different agency now, as are you. And mm -hmm. that was a level up. But this isn't a business <laughs> podcast. So. Exactly. Um, yeah, here we are in our first episode, and sadly, Allison is not um, joining us audibly or in Slack today. Ordinarily, she will be. Um, it's called BS on us, um, because that will be necessary. <laughs> yes, yes. Fairly really often, I would expect. Yep. Yeah. So, um, the premise of the podcast, right, is that we will be discussing a topic that we may or may know nothing about, but the topic will be disclosed at the start of the podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. then we'll make shit up if we don't know anything about it. Um, you can follow <laughs> <us> the, this <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you can follow us, the podcast, on Twitter at Binary Jazz, uh, and you can visit our website binaryjazz.us.us. Yeah, great. So Allison, um, though she is not here, she did suggest some topics in our Slack, and they were hidden as um, in threads. So I'm randomly going to select the thirst the the thirst Fred. The thirst. The thirst Fred. <laughs> that will be our topic for the day. Okay, the great. I don't know which one is the thirst, so. I'm about to announce it. Okay, um, great. With a drum roll. Topic is barefoot running. Uh-huh. Barefoot running. Um, so well, I, I personally I hate bears. bears. <laughs> it is spelled B-A-R-E. <laughs> barefoot running. Um, so are you a runner? No. No. I used Not to be. All. Yeah, I used to run. Um, I used to chase that runner's high, and I, um, I ran a marathon and a half marathon and a couple of 15Ks and then many uh, 5Ks. I don't get a runner's high. I get a runner's collapse and die. Yeah, I did two for a long time. Um, and I think I wanted to do it initially just because um, it seemed like a thing that smart people were doing. <laughs> running like oh i exercise daily like what do you do i run every morning it does oh, sound I should do like that. a smart thing yeah yeah and i thought that that would help me um you know i don't know focus more during the day or be a better or wholesome person or you know, I don't know people i admired there. were doing it and it seemed like a um like you know it seemed like a thing i should do so i really got into it um and like and anything I'm, i get into i got way too far into it and started tracking all sorts of silly metrics and um, you know, it started to impact too much of my life. So, um, I think my final like true run was, um, a marathon, Outer Banks marathon, uh, which is 26.2 miles, which is a stupid distance for a human being to run. Mm -hmm. um, I did it with shoes on. Um, <laughs> and about 19 miles in, I kind of hit the wall and crapped out and half walked, half limped the last seven miles. And then we spent the next two days, um, Visiting lighthouses in the Outer Banks. Um, you know, stepping up those stairs was, uh, it was probably good for stretching, but my, my knees felt very brittle. Mm. Um, so dad, that's my running experience. My dad runs uh, regularly still. 
Um, he's done races. I think he worked himself up to a marathon for his 50th birthday. Um, I don't run. And the reason I, the excuse I give for that is that I used to run as a kid or I used to want to run because my dad ran and I did a, a track and field event at some point. And, um, there was a sprint. I was a fairly decent sprinter. Um, and I did a sprint and my knee gave out in the middle of the sprint and I just fell on my face. And since then my knee has been iffy, just weird, like bubbly does weird things when it's cold. Um, it's just always sort of been a thing. And so I, yeah, running does not sound good because my knee is going to kick my ass. Hmm. Um, and barefoot running even more so. <laughs> so I kind of like the idea of barefoot running. Um, I think it would just be especially exhilarating through like a park or the woods or something, you know? Um, Except for the I, broken glass on the, on the sidewalk. Well, that's, that's like get in a park, you know, like a trail. Yeah. Maybe. Um, trail running would be appropriate for that. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm a Floridian, so I spend a lot of time on my back patio without shoes on. Yeah. Not you do. this time of year. Um, yeah. And um, my feet get pretty, pretty funky and nasty just on my patio, which I sweep very regularly. I can't imagine what my feet would look like after barefoot running. See, I hate feet in general, so that's another problem that I would have with barefoot running. Pretty ambivalent about feet. I mean, mine work Maybe I just well. hate my feet. I don't, <laughs> I don't really hate other people's feet. <laughs> yeah, this is not a foot podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so I do remember when I was running, um, I spent a lot of time researching shoes and um, arch support and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was a shoe company, although I don't know if you can call them shoes, maybe they were sandals. Um, Vibram, Vibram, Five Fingers, that you I've wore them. I've probably seen what you're talking about. Yeah, and like your feet went in, it was like a rubber sole, and your feet went in to the toes, or your toes went into the, it was like gloves for your feet with a rubber, rubber bottom, right? Yep, yep. Um, and if I recall correctly, the way it was manufactured was, um, it was like forward cut at an angle, so you got plenty of traction with it. So it, it theoretically felt like running barefoot. And I think the idea was that running barefoot is um, better for you. Yeah. You know, like being, a foot engineer, right? Or whatever. Being um, barefoot in general is better for you than wearing shoes because your feet aren't supposed to be constrained inside of a box. It's supposed, they're supposed to spread out. And your toes <laughs> are supposed to... Your toes, <laughs> Does that mean clowns have like really... No, I'm, I'm laughing at the concept. Like, does that mean clowns have like really good feet because they have plenty of like foot box area? I I doubt that the insides of a clown's shoes are actually as wide as as they appear. <sighs> That's so disappointing <laughs> to think about that. I would like to think that it holds like the ankle and the heel and like maybe up to the arch and then widens out like a spatula <laughs> in, like, internally. Right? <laughs> also, I think that would do like a good job to con like contain like foot odor. Like a big shoe like that, you know, probably, plenty of toe box. Probably area. not. Probably not. I, I don't know if it's true. I said I like to think it. I don't, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and your toes are supposed to be, you know, actually used for gripping, which obviously inside shoes they are not. Yeah. So the more access to more free reign your feet have, the better your, it is for your so feet, total and, nice and therefore order. for your whole body, theoretically. It probably is better for your back and legs. Yeah. I can imagine. So total non sequitur. Thinking about grip with your toes. Uh, my parents are in South Florida, and my dad sent me a message. It's cold down there right now. Sent me a message that um, when it's cold, the um, iguanas um, like fall into a deep hibernation and tend to fall out of trees. Hmm. So you're having like, iguanas like tumbling from trees, and then when it warms up, they like revive and are cool and can do go about their iguana lives. And <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking about like iguanas tumbling out of trees when you talked about like you know traction. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's um, yeah yeah so <clears throat> i think running the beach would be ideal barefoot right if you're a runner that would be the spot you want to do it although another non sequitur when i traveled to california for the first time i went to i don't know malibu or something i haven't been to the pacific ocean I need to go walk in the water you know and feel the pacific on my feet 
turns out it doesn't feel very different than the Atlantic. A bit Probably colder. colder. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what latitude I was at versus home. Probably for the higher north. and um, pretty much. Guaranteed. And I was very, uh, very concerned about hiking across the beach and stepping on hypodermic needles because apparently I had this like mental idea that there was like a huge drug epidemic in, in Malibu yeah, and people just were just tossing California. used, yeah, tossing used needles on the beach. I was yeah, like I, 16 at the time, so I mean, I, you know, I was as a former Californian. I'm highly offended. I'm, I, I didn't think you were. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, California in general, um, I like visiting, but I, I don't think I could ever live there. Uh, earthquakes freak me out, man. Oh, earthquakes are nothing. I, uh, earthquakes are actually kind of fun sometimes, as long as there's not something falling on your head. I, we caught a flight out there. I used to do um, sales calls in a previous life, and I had a customer out in California um, in the L.A. area. Um, I hate L.A., I will say that. Do people call it that, the L.A. area, or is there like a better way to refer to it? I think pretty much people call it hell. Okay. So I had a customer in hell and um, <laughs> we, we went to call on this guy and um, flying from Florida, like it's not a short flight. And some guy had a seizure in the bathroom while we were over Vegas. So we went from altitude to the Vegas tarmac pretty quickly and short story boring. We ended up in LA hours and hours late, um, like midnight in LA, which was 3am East coast time. They hadn't eaten dinner. So we stopped at this really sketchy Denny's like, hmm. you know, downtown LA across from a hotel. It was awesome. I mean, like, um, culture of, uh, of inner city, um, was very prevalent. And, um, mm -hmm. so I got back home, home, the hotel at, you know, like four thirty or something and laid down and there was an earthquake and, uh, <laughs> I just small, I mean, like yeah. I may have been the only person in hell that felt it that day. And, um, and, uh, that was it. Like I couldn't sleep. Then I just laid there like wide awake waiting to die. <laughs> 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 I did not die that day. Uh, we went to visit our customer at 9 a.m. the next morning, no sleep, and um, then called on a few other folks in, in hell. And uh, yeah, it was a good trip out there. Uh, and all the flight back was uneventful. In all seriousness, I think that actually uh, what is actually referred to the LA area in quotations is just LA because LA is just some huge, sprawling mass of uh, horrible urban construction. I didn't believe either that um, traffic jams just appeared in LA until I we. We were driving at 10.30 in the morning, mm. and, and at 10.34, suddenly we were at a complete stop in like a five-lane highway or something. Yep. Yeah. And for 30 minutes, and then with no apparent reason, we were flowing fine. So that. the fun thing that I find about L.A. Um, is flying over L.A. So, um, you know, in I think Star Wars, probably episode two, maybe, where you finally see what Coruscant, is that how you say it, Coruscant? Uh, looks like the the, the, the second C is silent. The 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 second C, so it's Coruscant. I think so. Okay, so you finally see what that planet looks like. You know that the Emperor is from there, and I've known you know the existence of this planet from like you know lore and and from playing uh, Star Wars Rebellion back in the day. Um, but uh, so you finally see what it looks like, and it's just basically an entire planet covered in city. Well, flying over LA is it looks exactly like that. It's like <laughs> we are living in the Empire, and this the Empire is Los Angeles. Um, I used to go to school in what was known as the Inland Empire, uh, which is also a terrifying thing. And um, in retrospect, I refer to it as the Hellmouth um, because I'm fairly sure that uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the city of Sunnydale, is. Redlands, the city that uh, I went to university in, um, because both both because of the geographic proximity to other things, because she was in LA and then she sort of went east and inland and into this, this sort of like little tiny city with a college in the town um, that nobody really knew about, and it wasn't like San Bernardino or Riverside; it was just this little unknown pocket thing, uh, which also describes Redland. Um, and also because it was the pit of hell, uh, because there's a hell mouth, um, and Redlands is basically, so there's a, there's a, a mountain range that circles around, uh, the Inland Empire, which is why it's called the Inland Empire. And the dead center of that mountain is Redlands basically. Um, and the unique geographical feature of those mountains surrounding, uh, mean that all the smog from Los Angeles gets blown by the wind from the coast and sits right above right in that little pocket, that range of mountains. So all the smog just sits right in Redlands, uh, hmm. which is another reason why it was, you know, the pit of hell uh, and why it's the hell mouth. So uh, that's my uh, 
claim to Southern California fame. Uh, I, I love California. I hate SoCal. I don't know that I could live in California. Well, that's not true. I could live in the coast in like Pescadero or Half Moon Bay or maybe Colma or somewhere along along the ocean. I don't think that I could go back and live in San Francisco again because it's a different place now. But so I now like. you're, you're currently in Utah, right? Yes. And you would characterize yourself as like an outdoorsman in the sense that you appreciate the outdoors, not like a hunter, like an outdoorsman. Like, like you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like outdoorsman has like a different connotation than I meant. Um, yeah. So you, you, you visit national parks and local parks and that sort of thing on a very regular basis. Yes. Do you run into a lot of runners at those parks? Sometimes. Sometimes. You're bringing it around to the topic, aren't you? I was kind of trying to. Um, I mean, I sort of felt like we, we ought to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like my visits to, to state parks and national parks, I don't feel that I see a lot of barefoot runners. I do feel as though I see a lot of runners. Um, and these days I feel guilty that I'm not doing something to be healthier. Um, I see barefoot running on the beach when I go to the beach but uh, in California, but I don't see a huge amount in yeah, other places. I see a lot, lot of like trail runners in, in other forests and places. Yeah, I used to, when I, was, when I was a runner, um, I, uh, there was a park near my house that um, had like a, I don't know, it's a small loop. I mean, less than a mile loop, um, but it was in a pretty rural area. You had to drive quite a ways back to get to this loop. Um, and it wasn't very well utilized. Like I didn't run into people very often, but I did almost run into a deer at one point while I was running. I came around a corner and there was a deer in the trail and um, I about crashed into its butt and it <clears> jumped and I also jumped and it took off. Um, and I ran with quite a bit of adrenaline for the next, I don't know, half mile or so. It was, uh, it was exhilarating. It was fun. Plus one would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going to probably, run. probably not the same experience though as if you ran into a moose that would probably be a little bit more uh, dangerous uh, you know this thing yeah it felt um, I mean it felt like it was uh, its butt was about as tall as my shoulders and I don't know like really if that was the case or not I mean it felt like uh, this is not an animal I want to anger because I'm not equipped to fight an animal like this I don't even know how this animal fights but I feel like it like a good swift kick from this animal would would dissuade me from not from being involved with this animal. In it way. would so, probably try to butt you with its horns if it was a male. And if it was female, I'd probably just run away. Yeah, I believe it had no horns. Um, but still, it was enough to, to freak me out. I, um, oh, it's been like a decade now, but I was in Yellowstone years back, uh, which I love. Uh, and went on a long hike to see a beaver dam somewhere in the north, near the north entrance. And, um, mm -hmm. There was some elk on the trail. We were coming mm -hmm. across like a uh, pretty nice ball, and there was some elk on the trails with my dad. He and I were the only ones that were up for this hike. And um, this elk was standing there, and I said, you know, as we walk closer, it'll just go away. My dad said, okay, you go first, right? So I walked and walked and walked, and I got about four feet from the elk, and the elk picked up its head and looked at me, and um, they're large animals. And I decided mm -hmm. that I would take another route around the elk, and he could have the trail. Um, I mean, never mind like the buffalo there, which are... Insanely beautiful and insanely huge, but yeah, I don't, know the, I don't know if the animals at Yellowstone really give a crap about people. I think they most of them don't just about me. <laughs> I think, I mean, because because hunting has not, I mean, has not been allowed there for so long. They've basically lived an entire in existence without like people being particularly dangerous to them, and oftentimes uh, people and has also historically. Uh, people have fed the animals, so we're kind of like a source of of food. So I don't know if they would really care my my grandmother used to tell a story of of uh visiting yellowstone uh with my grandfather and my dad when he was a kid and they um you know how there's all the signs when you go to yellowstone and basically everywhere but particularly yellowstone there's all the signs don't feed the bears well this is a story about my grandfather feeding the bears uh, <laughs> 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 they're in you know their car and they're driving through and there's a bear and he's like sticking, I don't know, food through the window to the bear. And the bear is like clawing at the window. And my grandmother's screaming at him to stop doing it. And he's like, oh, no, it is cute. And the bear and the bear is up on its hind legs, obviously terrifying. And, that does sound and, cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, that's single-handedly the reason why there's scientists say don't feed the bears. <laughs> 
I, I suspect that in that time period, probably a lot of people fed the bears. It probably wasn't just my grandfather, but I like to think that that's the reason why those signs are there. Like the one person that spoiled it for everyone. So is he, is he still alive or that's no. like his legacy? That's what he's left on Yeah, that's <laughs> the legacy. The bears. That, that, and, uh, that and some crazy story that she also used to like to tell about um, losing their brakes uh, down a mountain. <laughs> So they're careening down this this mountain with a windy road, and they have no brakes. Yeah, and in like this old like roadster sort of car thing with like the 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 step railing, whatever it's called, you know, that you step on to get into the car. Yeah. Huh. I remember I've seen pictures of the car, and she and she every time I see the every time she showed me the picture, she would tell me that that was the one that they lost their brakes in and went down the mountain <laughs> and didn't have brakes. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, we just celebrated um, my grandfather's ninety fourth birthday i think mm-hmm. 93rd birthday Happy so birthday. that's probably a number i should know yeah yeah uh and he's after I mean, after like 90 it just uh, stops mattering i think we were eating dinner with him and he pulled out his driver's license to show that he um he had his last driver's license test and his license is valid until he's 100 he's very proud <laughs> of that which is, I mean, which is awesome right um but you know I, I think about that like like we're if i told you the same story like i don't know every time we have this podcast you'd probably cut me off and be like, dude, you've already told me this story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would. But with older folks, like it's, I don't know, there's something endearing and, um, I don't know, magical about about the, the their experiences and being able to share that that um, I really appreciate. I didn't think so at the time. That's probably fair. <laughs> um, you're older and more mature now. Yes, yes. And I, I think probably uh, now, you're older, right? uh, now that my... Uh, none of my grandparents. Well, I guess my, my grandfather, on my, my maternal grandfather is still around. Uh, but other than that, all my grandparents are, are passed on. Um, I do appreciate that she reiterated the same stories over and over because that means that I can sort of tell them with some sort of uh, uh, degree of uh, actually remembering the story instead of just making shit up. Yeah. <laughs> there should be a podcast. Which brings us sure. back to uh, Barefoot Running. <laughs> Um, so no, the, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, it kind of does, right? So the, the physical engineering side, right? We know it's better for the body. We are concerned about, we think it's better for the body. I mean, that's we think it's, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of big on science. I, I feel like, I feel like it's kind you know, of big on science. It's test driven design, right? I mean, that's, it's, that's, that's very, uh, uncommitted <laughs> kind of big what? on science. <laughs> Look, science is driven by testing, right? So if you're if you're testing the right things, then it's useful. But I mean, it's like lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, I mean, you can sort of test anything you want, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I yes, science is important in my household. Um, we think about science things. Science is and, real. Oh, I love that album. Um, <laughs> may, we may we may actually have that in the in the minivan right now. Um, we we'll listen to uh, bare naked ladies. Um, nope. Snack time yesterday. Nope. Yeah, it's a good album, man. Some funny stuff in there. Um, but they might be giants. We have a couple of their kids' albums that uh, regularly make it into rotation. Yeah. Our kids, uh, particularly my son, uh, insists on audiobooks. We started doing audiobooks in the car mm. for long for long trips, and also like not long trips, just for normal, just driving around town. Um, but that's like. He insists on on audiobooks. If we put on music, then then he gets pissed off um, because it's boring. Read, yeah, yeah it's, it's boring, right? Like it's it's so you're sitting in the car, so at least an audiobook kind of gives you something to do, which I can relate to. But I also like listening to you know LCD. You know how like and, your your parents always say, maybe your parents. My parents always said like, I hope you have a kid like you, right? Um, and my son is that kid, so he we can be riding in the car and he gets into a book, and I mean like a multi-hour car ride like we can finish the drive and um like everyone else is getting out of the car because they're exhausted from riding in the car mm. and he is still like buried in that book mm-hmm. like yo dude get out of the car get out of the car <laughs> he, i mean it's like it takes a lot to jar him from that focus um yeah yeah so i mean music doesn't really do it like my daughter likes music my son wants to read a book while the music's on and um i mean he read he's he is a prolific reader he mm-hmm. read anything. Uh, and he was at a time when we can read a lot of things. I mean, like, you know, when I was that age, you had to read the back of the cereal box over and over again. 
Um, <laughs> I don't think that so. was literally true. I mean, I don't think I had to. My parents weren't like, hey, you can read the cereal box 17 times. Or you're grounded for the week. I, need I got grounded for the week for a lot of other reasons, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, you know, like if he asks about a topic, like we can fire up Wikipedia and read it and then think yes. about... The age of Wikipedia has, is kind of pretty pretty life-changing for, especially uh, as sort of home educators. Um, we school our kids at home we unschool uh which means that we do the opposite of school <laughs> whatever school does we just go <laughs> the other direction um and uh sort of the pretense or the premise of of, of unschooling is child directed learning uh that they are in charge of their own education that you don't learn from books or from less i mean you learn from books but you don't learn from somebody telling you about a thing you learn from exploring it on your own and being interested in that thing um, that's how I learned programming. That's how you learn programming. That's how we retain information. We don't retain information that's been like fed to us. And most of school is academic school is is just rote memorization and some person telling you to sit and sit down and shut up. So, uh, yeah, Wikipedia is really good for that. So that and barefoot right? running. Um, I guess I guess there's two topics to discuss at this point. Um, Let's maybe keep it pertinent to barefoot running. One of the one of the things about running was um, theoretically, right? Was um, you know it's supposed to help focus and energy through the day. Um, mm -hmm. Focus, I could totally see, but energy, man, I'm calling bullshit on that. Like I would run in the morning, and people were like, "Oh, you're going to feel energized through the day." Like, no, I, I feel tired. I ran three miles this morning. Like I'm freaking exhausted all day, and I'm supposed to do it again tomorrow. Like that was the part of running I didn't that didn't jive for me. Um, but I did totally get the runners high. Like it was it was a like that I get like the total buzz coming home after running three miles. Um, you know, and rehydrating, and I mean, in Florida, you know, it's 85 and crazy humid. And I was going to say, the humidity might have something to do with the exhaustion. You know, there may be something to that. Maybe if I ran in, like, a more forgiving climate, I would have been energized throughout the day. Although, I guess, like, I'm on days that I work on the back porch, so if the kids are home from school, and um, if it's summer, and I'm going to work on the back porch, like, it is common these days for me to be out there in, like, you know, t-shirt and shorts, and with, like, a half gallon of water um, and work all day. And at five o'clock, like pretty exhausted from just sitting outside and sweating. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not great on the computer either. Like you have to clean like the, you know, salt crystals off of the um, keyboard. And I don't want to hear about your salt crystals. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's not great for the keyboard, I guess. Uh, really, but just where your palms rest. I've also found that Adirondack chairs are terrible for, um, for wrist pain. Mm. Um, pretty much everything is horrible for wrist pain. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm remote right now. I'm at a, um, I'm at a hotel and I'm, the table I'm at has a super high surface. Um, and before this call, I was, I was doing some, uh, doing some work and I, I found that to be pretty comfortable, uh, much better than, you know, with a laptop in my lap and mm. feet up in the air. Well, you're supposed to have like your, your elbows are basically supposed to be at a 90 degree angle ergonomically. That's how, that's how you're supposed to, when you're, and I, I know this because I did some amount of research when I was trying to put together a DIY uh, standing desk. And so I was figuring out like what, you know, what height the, the keyboard should be at. And, and so ergonomically, your, your elbows are supposed to be at a, at a 90 degree angle um, to not put additional weight on your wrists either in another direction. Yes, yeah, so my screen is supposed to be like eye level and all that stuff. Huh. My standing desk is... Um, when I'm tired of sitting, I go into the kitchen and set it on the counter in the kitchen. And a the lot kitchen of counters counter has, are about the right height. Well, it has two levels. So if I feel like I'm not feeling it at one level, I can go yeah. up another six or eight inches or so and, and rock it out there. Um, but, I, you know, I'm not typing on calls. So calls, I'm generally, generally out in the backyard. and um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of population that's not in sunny areas. Hmm. So I feel like I need to provide... <laughs> So, I, so I've heard. Um, a lot of the folks I work with are not in sunny areas. Um, so yeah, I like to go outside and with a palm tree in the background. Mm -hmm. um, or potentially in a hammock. And, and make everybody that, that has 20 degree weather at the moment uh, insanely, horrendously jealous and angry. Well, you know, part of that too is you can't, you can't, um, you can't mind sweating on camera. You know, because sometimes you're going to be out there and it's going to be humid and hot. And, you know, it's better than being inside. I found that fresh air is probably, maybe that was what helped me focus during the day when I would run, would be the fresh air. You know, I'd go out and spend 
you know, 30 minutes getting fresh air in the morning. And I had a lot of focus. I feel like I have a lot of focus. Um, I think I'm going to call bullshit on the fresh air thing. I think that's a different legend. That's fine. I mean, not, not that, not that fresh air is not good. Yeah. Just that I don't think fresh air is the, is the, has the healing properties (laughs) that it is given to have. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I feel like internal environments, like, I do think the vitamin D. Nasty. Yeah. I do think vitamin D. On the other hand, that's. Sort of, I mean, maybe and maybe that's the fresh air that is. You know, could be, yeah. could be. Um, I'm a big fan of the vitamin D. I mean, I, I chase it, and uh, we, we spent seven hours in the car yesterday for a four hour car ride, mm. um, in the snow. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, it was fun. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, I've driven in snow before, but not like while it's actively snowing. Um, and we're a poor man. Oh man, it was neat. Like I'm, I'm glad to have put that on my bucket list and checked it off all on the same day. And I need to do it again. Do it again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm golden on that now. Um, no, I mean, it was totally interesting and, um, fascinating, know, the, fascinating drive. The, um, the, the novelty of snow has worn off in the 12, 14 years that I've lived in Utah. no, longer than that i graduated in 2001 it's now 2018 so that makes it about 17 years that i've lived here jesus um yeah so the novelty of snow is worn off the novelty of driving the snow (laughs) driving in the snow has worn off uh all of that all those things um i did drive through snow recently we went to uh we drove up to idaho tip of idaho at the panhandle uh to visit uh my partner's family uh, for Christmas, and then we drove from Moscow, Idaho, uh, over to Seattle. Uh, and my parents flew up to Seattle, and we hung out with my parents uh, in Seattle, and we spent New Year's there, and then drove back. Um, so on the trip from, I mean, and there is snow. I mean, Idaho is ridiculously snowy. Um, not on the drive though, which is good. Uh, there was some snow going through the mountains to Seattle. Um, and I did have one like heart stopping moment. Usually I have multiple heart stopping moments. So this was a pretty good trip. Um, I had one heart stopping moment, uh, over the, over the past, uh, Snoqualmie past, uh, Seattle where, um, we we're literally like this, like the, the speed, the, you know, the, the flow of traffic was going about 60 miles an hour because it wasn't too bad yet. And then suddenly it was going 10 miles an hour. Um, oh. and you didn't really see it coming cause it was kind of like over the, over the hill. Um, so as soon as I saw the red lights, I hit, the, I hit the brakes. I mean, not like I slammed on them, but I, you know, I hit the brakes and then I felt the traction just lose as my, as the car is slowing down. Um, nothing happened. I mean, it was totally fine. Um, we just, but I could feel it and I was like, Oh my God, Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, good. We're good. Okay. We're good. <laughs> um, so yeah, one heart stopping moment, but, but that's just, uh, that's sort of par for the course. We didn't, we didn't swerve or anything like that. It wasn't bad. It was just, you know, and, and that's the thing, like, um, basically it's really easy on snow and ice to, to lose control. And if you do, if you panic, um, then you're going to generally make it a whole lot worse. Um, so it's like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy strategy. Don't yeah, that's yes, what you exactly. do. Snow. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, and then, and it's also like, it's counterintuitive because if you start, if you start, swerving in one direction you're supposed to turn into that direction um to reorient your your vehicle um but does that matter that, like with front wheel or rear wheel drive car that that applies in every car yes although you're gonna have more traction in a four-wheel drive car just in general um so four-wheel drive cars have less of a problem with that um so it's most of the front wheel drive cars but um even so yeah uh rear wheel drive cars you're fucked um <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, that's why they don't make rear wheel drive. I don't think, uh, anymore. Um, but yeah, so, uh, <laughs> dude, I was driving through the South, right? So every vehicle that passed us was a pickup truck. Clearly. Yep. Yep. I mean, exactly. Um, and uh, I just visited Nashville recently for work camp us. And, oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So I've, I've now, I can now say I've been in the South. Was that your first trip to the South? Yes. Wow. I've, I've never, I've never, I mean, I've, I've gone, for for retreats, I've gone to Wisconsin, and uh-huh. I've gone to. Uh, it's beautiful this time of year, right here. And the Poconos, which is our other uh, uh, former agency retreat. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's like the first. I mean, and then I've gone abroad to to Europe, but I haven't I haven't done the southern United States like ever. 
I've done lots of the Pacific Northwest. I've done the West Coast. I've done the South, the Southwest, mm. and uh, I've done like around here. And like I've gone to Yellowstone many times, but I haven't gone that far. East. I would recommend um, like the Everglades and the yes. Keys. Well, that's that's definitely on the list. Amazing areas. We're trying to find an excuse to get us to Florida this year. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, a live podcast would be why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's I think time. the climate probably oh wait, real quick though. I think climate is the thing we didn't consider when we talked about barefoot running. It's true. I was barefoot in snow. I um the one time I tried to run in snow, I was training for my marathon and I was in Wisconsin, um, in a city called Janesville, and it was really coming down. And uh I don't know, I mean I don't think it's really coming down. Snow. I did. I put on my little running shorts and I put my running shirt and I figured, oh, well, God. I'm gonna warm up after no, you're after not. like a half mile. No, you're not. So I took off and no, um, in fact, totally you're... slipped and busted my ass right outside the hotel tour. <laughs> no, um, in, in, in fact, you're going to get hypothermia because the sweat is going to freeze on you and stay there. So I made it like two laps around and said, F this, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, but I did have a guy that we worked with and I'm going to, I'm going to name him because I think his name is notable because it's just interesting. His name was Smokey White. Um, <laughs> which is, I mean like awesome, right? Like if you smell a salesman, of that name called on you, you remember like, him. It's like it's like if Smokey Robinson and Barry White had a had a love child to be Smokey White. He he could sort of fit that role. He was uh, he was from actually from uh, from Southern California. Uh, great guy, um, but he was uh, at the time he was living in Chicago and he was a runner and he said he just loved to run in the cold and he said it was all about like bundling bundling yeah. up for it. You know, you have to um, you have to wear special and, clothing. I mean, I you can't own, go out in your running shirts. Yeah, I own a few uh, long sleeve shirts, and uh, I'm not sure what I would do for shorts if I was running. But thankfully, I'm not. So that problem solved itself, didn't it? <laughs> um, you were going to say you think it's time. I was going to say I think it's time for us. To, to for us to do uh, questions. So we have the we we have the format of this is we talk about a thing which we did uh, right. and come up with some <laughs> conclusion or not. <laughs> I, mean, I guess. Uh, and then oh, oh, let's come to a conclusion. Like so, yeah, your name pro uh, pro, sure. or pro yeah, pro I mean, barefoot running. Your boat. I'm fine. It's great. Yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're done with it, go I, for it. I still hate feet. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and now, uh, so at the end of the show, we, we do questions. And since we don't have uh, questions that are sent to us because we just barely started, uh, then we have some questions that were provided to us by Allison. Uh, and probably we'll continue in that vein until uh, we start getting questions from actual listeners. So if you would like to submit a question, uh, go to binaryjazz.us. Uh, and you can, there's a form right there on the page and we'll ask it on the show. But in the meantime, we have three questions. Uh, the first question being, who is your second favorite Beatle and why? And there's no qualifiers, living or dead. Right. Yeah. No, second favorite. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Ringo. See, um, I, I, I thought about Ringo. I thought about Ringo, but realistically, my second favorite is, is probably Paul. And okay. not because not because I actually like Paul, and not because I dislike Ringo or I like Paul more than Ringo. It's because Paul is second in everything, mm -hmm. and he needs mm -hmm. to be the second. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the like your. I think I feel right, like, like all the other Beatles are like tied for first. Yeah, one and two would be John and Paul, right? For like any any normal chart, right? Or one and one, and then yeah, one one, one and first. one is like John, yeah. Ringo, and George. Yeah, um, <laughs> Paul is number two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think Ringo because of, of, what was that train show? Um, Thomas the Trank, Thomas the, Thomas the Trank, Thomas, Thomas the Train Engine, Thomas the Tank, Thomas the, Thomas. yeah, Thomas the Tank, whatever it is, that yeah, one. Uh -huh. um, Ringo was on that, I guess. So. He narrated it for, Did um, it. I don't know, several he's seasons good. before George, George Carlin, maybe after George Carlin, I think before George Carlin. I guess he's got a goofy British voice, so that works. Um, I mean, I think he's a, I think he's a, a great guy, and um, I don't know what he's doing. I feel like he should be more visible than Paul these days, right? There's only two of them left, and you know, Paul's the guy we get. But did you see him at the Grammys? This is a weird no, segue. I don't, we I Grammys. Don't, no, I don't Grammy. So I watch the Grammys because I always find it fascinating what like mashups they do live, because um, it's always interesting and bizarre, and sometimes I even know the songs they're doing. Um, but Paul did a thing a couple years ago, maybe three years ago now at the Grammys that. Um, it was really disappointing. I'm mean, not like disappointing, like your parents will be disappointed in you, but disappointing, like <laughs> I expect, well, maybe, maybe it is like, I expected more out of you than that. So yeah, I guess it is the same. Yeah, pretty um, much is the same. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, so I guess, I guess I'll put Ringo in a second. 
Okay. Well, good. There we go. There's number two. Uh, if I gave you $10 to go and buy something, it only costs three. Would you bring me all the change or would you tell me it was actually $10? I'd bring you all the change. And this is, it's the nature of like, of, of our relationship, Chris. Yes. You know? I, I, I feel bring like, change. I feel like I would do that to people that I am friends with and I'd be less likely to do it if it was some random schmo, I guess. Although no, it's situational, right? Like I might text you and be like, yo dude, these are only three bucks. Do you want two or three? Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's some wiggle room. Yeah. To be so. fair, I've, I've been uh, in the last year far more uh, generous with even random schmoes uh, than I have ever been in the past. Um, so I feel like probably I would, I would like, if you, if you needed $3 for a thing, I'd probably give you like a 20 that I have in my wallet or something. Um, which I've, yeah. Cause I, I, when we were in, where was it? Was it Nashville? Yeah, it must've been Nashville. I think, uh, there was a couple times. I think, I, I think I gave away like $50, um, to random people. One dude was like, Hey, I, I've this, like my, bank card is I've got nothing in the bank and I've got $25 in my wallet and they, I need, I lock myself out of my car and he's trying to get into his car and he needs $50 for the locksmith to come and, and get him out of his car. Um, and I, and I've got a couple twenties in my wallet. I'm like here, you know, and he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the money or something. And he's not going to do it. And I don't care because like, um, he was African American and it was a parking lot. It was like this dude, like I'm, I'm thinking about my privilege and, and this dude, like if he, if somebody, if a police car drove up that minute and saw some dude trying to break into his own car and he's African American, I'm, you know, he's going to get shot or he's going to get, you know, the, the right. experience he's going to have is very different than the experience that I'm going to have. So he can have my fucking $40. I don't care. You know, um, similar thing, like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pay for a, a parking place in downtown Nashville and some, you know, African-American dude comes up to me and is like, Oh, you do this and you do this and whatever. And I'm like, okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and he's like, Hey, I'm trying to buy dinner or whatever. I haven't eaten all day. I'm like, okay, sure. Here's 20. Like, I don't take it because you need it more than I do. Um, and I'm in a place now that, that I feel like I can do those things, which is kind of interesting. Um, cause I've never been. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that has to do with the $10 and $3 thing. Uh, I would probably give you your freaking $7. I, or I, I, if it was $3, dude, just have a thing. I'll, I'll, I'll spot you whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. There's that inherent, um, in friendship, there's that, like the, that inherent, I don't know. There's like a certain like inherent dollar amount that like, who cares, right? Yeah. So for three bucks, I come already there. Like, well, we'll just sort it out later, you know? Yeah. Which is code for, buy me some French fries sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Question three: When should you feel guilty for killing zombies? This is my favorite question. <laughs> uh, of of these questions, oh, this is my favorite question. I never really got into the whole zombie thing. You know, that was popular a few years back with Walking Dead, and I understand Walking Dead wasn't really about zombies, but I don't know. Like the whole concept of zombies to me seems kind of like I don't know. It just doesn't. I, 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 did, I did a whole silly. thing on so. I did a whole thing on on zombies. Uh, I did a deep dive into zombies <coughs> a few years ago. Um, I mean, my answer is they're already undead. So yeah, see, you can never feel guilty for killing zombies. Well, it's that simple. I mean, that's the whole pretense of that's the whole uh, that's the whole pretense of, of Walking Dead, right? Though, like, like I mean, the reason why I didn't watch, watch Walking Dead was because of this element of. Uh, that was added to Walking Dead that I actually haven't seen in very many, and not that I've seen like a ton of zombie movies, but usually zombie lore and zombie movies are all about like just sort of like the faceless undead, like just the random people and maybe you recognize them, but it's not anyone that you have any sort of a direct connection with, right? It's just sort of like random mindless violence. Um, and it, it, you know, at its core zombie, zombie, the the idea behind zombies and the reason why they're frightening is because it, it it brings you face to face with death and we're afraid of dying and we're afraid of like what we what is there for us after we are gone um that's sort of like that is the horror of the zombie genre um but what 
I felt Walking Dead added, and the reason why I never watched it, um, was because it added this element of having a uh, emotional connection to the victims of of the zombie uh, virus outbreak, whatever. And sure. and like there was a scene I remember. I think we only watched like one or two episodes, and there was a scene where a guy is forced to shoot his own wife. Um, who has who is now a zombie and i i can't i i just i mean i'm i'm growing soft in my old age and i i totally i totally own that but i can't i can't do that i that's and it, it gets to the point where and and i have a we have a thing uh my partner and i have a thing with like just watching shows television in general in that you know it's supposed to be fantasy it's supposed to be a, a release and a relaxing thing and if it if it goes beyond that into like actually making you like really disturbed and upset, then it's not worth your time. It's not worth watching. You need to do something else with your brain. Um, and yeah, I can't do that. I can't. Nope. 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 So I would feel guilty probably killing every zombie, honestly, um, because there used to be a person there. Yeah. I, I found the off on the opposite side because I, I, for the same reason, right. I think like they're already undead, you know? So like, I think killing at this point is, is not a yeah it's not, not it's a, a more of a it's mercy a, it's more yeah. of a mercy and and the release but, right yeah um, i still i mean I, I couldn't do it if i recognize the per- i mean i just i can't i want to go back to one thing where you said real quick um about um about your, your choice of television i think t- it's really interesting like how television has become like the default entertainment we all consume right mm. um I mean, I say we all like. I, I mean, in my house, it's the same. I mean, we we only we only stream, so it's Netflix, and so we we binge on series here and there. But um, I mean, but what happened to like, you know, how did TV suddenly? I mean, I got, it's it's a simple answer, right? It's easy if it's in your house, and you know, one button, and it's it's there. Um, but I mean, it's it's interesting that TV became like the default entertainment for everything. You know, over over live music, over recorded music, over going and seeing you know a show with actors, over going and seeing a movie, over you know, tons of other things. TV is convenience and it's pacifying and it is, yeah. not, and it's not active. Yeah. I mean, it's I guess not the age of brain. Yeah. I guess I'm not like as, as question like why, but it's just interesting that, yeah. that it, that's the case. And, um, you know, I mean, I see it, my kids, like we don't, we don't do a lot of screen time. Um, but when the TV's on, it's, it's hard to have a conversation with them because there's that, uh, external, uh, focus that's, that's taking a portion of their brain and, you know, you can't have a real, real conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did we, uh, did we do it? Did we, yeah. did we complete our first episode? I think we did. Wow. And there were no fist fights. Well, um, it'd be difficult to fist fight when you're in, uh, where are you? Georgia. And I'm in Utah. I'm in Georgia right now. Yep. Hey, is this your first podcast series, by the way? No. No, I, I, uh, it's my first podcast with another person. Um, I had not zombie. I, yeah, right. Non zombie. Yep. Uh, I had a blog that I, I ran. Uh, I still, I mean, I still own it. Uh, that was a sort of a fan, uh, blog for my, uh, favorite sports team, which is Real Salt Lake, so major league uh-huh. soccer. And, um, I decided that I had ideas, uh, that I could just spit out. Uh, verbally and then not have to write. Uh, so I did a podcast for a couple episodes. Uh, that was the RSL Diary. The RSL Diary is the name of the blog and RSL Diary podcast was the podcast. So um, that is the first podcast that I have done. And obviously I've done video tutorial stuff uh, as well. With a, I'm the author of several online video tutorials at Pluralsight. You can go check them out. Uh, Chris Reynolds and I've done WordPress things. Yep, there's a plug there. Um, and uh, so that's why I have the cool microphone and headphones and stuff. But uh, yeah, gotcha. this, is my, this is my first podcast with another human being. Gotcha. I used to produce one and produce like in the sense that somebody had to get the recorded audio video and get it up online. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. That's, I, guess, I guess that counts too. So I, I, I sort of started a, a hangout, a live hangout for uh, Event Espresso when I used to work with them. Um, so we did a live hangout with a couple members of the, the team, and I think we did one episode with, um, uh, uh, what's his name? 
I'm a, Eric, uh, Eric Amundsen from Ivy Cat uh, Studios up in Seattle, um, who did a lot of event special stuff. And um, that sounds really awful in your background. Um, somebody's Sorry. like, somebody's like hacking, hacking a lung back there. And hopefully they're okay. Uh, anyway, we did a, we did a Seems live so. hangout and uh, nobody really tuned in, I don't think. Um, but then we turned that into a podcast. Uh, so I was involved in shaking the video and, and ripping the audio from the video because we did it on, on Google Hangouts. And so then I would go to like whatever uh, pirate uh, site to extract the MP3 from the video on YouTube, uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, and then I did that. And then I would turn that into a podcast and, and put it up on gotcha. iTunes. So I've done, I've done that stuff. Yeah, we had one that we did. Um weekly with a band I used to work with and uh, we would try and shoot on a, at a different location every time. Um, so, I mean, ultimately it was, it was not great, not well viewed because it was nearly just podcasting and it was just an interesting, you know, distraction. But I did get some great video footage of a gopher tortoise um, crossing a road at one point. Gopher tortoise. Yeah. I, yeah. It's like a big old ugly, dirty turtle, fat turtle. Um, they're probably. Why is it called a gopher tortoise? Because they burrow. They live in the ground. Oh, okay. Um, they're a protected species. In, uh, Interesting. I have a couple that live in my backyard. And that would be why they're dirty, because they're living there. They burrow, yeah. 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 I find it fascinating, too. They drink when it rains by like opening their mouths and putting it at the, at the ground so the water running down in their burrow comes into their mouth. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So we don't have to do a, uh, a segment on gopher tortoises, I suppose. That's everything I know about them. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool, cool. So we are at um, binaryjazz.us mm -hmm. um, and on Twitter at binaryjazz. Mm -hmm. And the website has all of our individual Twitters as well mm. as our individual websites and pictures of our beautiful faces. Um, so you can uh, chastise us on Twitter directly. Yes. If we said something silly. Can and should. Wrong. I agree. Yeah, can and should. Yeah. I think that's I think that's the part I'm most looking forward to. <laughs> Great. But in in all reality, there'll be like three people listening, so that's good. Um but the for two of those three people listening, you should absolutely review us uh when we are up on iTunes and and tell the world that we are the greatest podcast that ever podcasted. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Good. I don't know. Do we have a closing thing, or do we just sort of yeah, awkwardly got stare at each, or do we just sort of have uh, just awkwardly stare at each other? That kind of sounds how I've been most calls at work, right? Excellent. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna awkwardly stare each other at each other, and then we're gonna bumper this out. And uh, thanks for listening.